Okay, um, before I even get started, I wanted to illustrate for you the fact that organic lawns exist and they can be managed. Uh, this is Chip Osborne over on the right there. He uh, does organic lawns, parks, school grounds, and national monuments. And this happens to be Irvine, California last spring. Um, <clears throat> this lawn they're standing on was produced in, it turned out only one year, he thought it was going to take two years. A year before there was 30% grass here and all the rest was bare soil and salty land. And the, he, they, he was invited in, he came in and basically did this for free for the city of Irvine. <clears throat> um, and now people in Irvine uh, will provide free advice on how they got their organic lawns. Uh, and so I just wanted to let you know there, that's just one example of solutions to problems. I'd like to talk about uh, PGMO crops and pesticide use, unexpected relationships. And uh, everybody knows about bees and how they're pollinators. Well, it turns out that we are also pollinators in a sense. We're slow pollinators. And I'm asking the question, are we also looking at colony collapse disorder? A very interesting parallel. Uh, so what I'm going to do is present data. I want you to be able to decide for yourself. What do we know and uh, what are the prognoses for the future? I want to point out that what I'm presenting today is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, things aren't always what they seem. And it's very much like old Charlie driving the LA freeways last spring. And as he was driving along, his cell phone went off, and it was his wife, and she says, Charlie, Charlie, be careful, there's some idiot on the freeway driving the wrong way. <laughs> and he says, what do you mean one? He says, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> so I want to talk about today how everything is interconnected, how we have basic, I'm going to define some basic principles and some new definitions, how common pesticide mixtures can modify reproduction, sex behavior, learning, immune function, and induce chronic disease. And I'm also going to talk about safe, effective, inexpensive solutions to these problems. Because for every problem, there's always a solution or solutions. First, I want to ask you, what do magicians, pickpockets, the current administration, and PGMO, and that means pesticide-related GMOs, advertisements have in common? Distraction, so you can't see what's going on. Why did saccharin cause cancer? It didn't. It was the traces of solvent used in its manufacture that caused the cancer. Little things mean a lot. And that's really what we're going to talk about because very low levels of pesticides can have all kinds of effects that are never tested in any kind of registration process by the EPA. So when EPA says it's safe, that only means they've looked at a very few things, and I'll show you also how biased that registration process is. I want to illustrate the scientific process for you. We start with data, and that's what I'm going to show you today, which generates a hypothesis, and you get more data, and then you get a theory, and you get more data, and then you get a law. <clears throat> that's how we work it. And so this is about data today. Here's the first example. I'm going to show you three examples. The first one is related to the endocrine system, and it deals with human sperm counts. In, 60, uh, in 1940s, the early 1940s, 60 to 70 percent of U.S. males qualified as sperm donors. This is the amount of sperm being produced, and on the other side, it's the percent of the sperm that are normal. <clears throat> By about 1990, six to seven percent U.S. males qualified as sperm donors. <clears throat> These de this whole thing was started by Niels Skakabach and Elizabeth Carlson in, in Denmark, where they noticed that the Danish sperm count was way down here for males uh, uh, in, the, in the cities, in the urban areas, but in organic farmers, here was their sperm count, way up there. So it looked like there was some kind of environmental thing going on, and when that first came out, everybody said, nonsense, that's a lot of baloney. And you can't see it in red here, but Auger and his colleagues in, in Paris 
uh, they had their own private uh, uh, database on human sperm counts in Paris because, of course, the Parisians are very proud of their sperm counts. <coughs> <laughs> And in the 1970s, they had about 90, 90 million sperm per milliliter here. By two, in two decades later, in the 90s, 1990s, they were down to here. And there was a consistent 3% decline in Parisian sperm counts. That is continuing. In 2017, Levine, Levine and his colleagues did a thorough overhaul of all of these data from these different studies. And here is the latest data on human sperm counts. As you can see, we're not very far away from having more deaths than births planet-wide because these are global data. And if we get down to 3 million sperm per milliliter, we will have zero fertility, which is out here somewhere. This, by the way, is about the time when that ice wall down in Antarctica will be melted enough to allow the entire our Antarctic ice sheet to slide into the oceans. I want to point out that <clears throat> by uh, 2012, only 1% of Israeli soldiers qualified as sperm donors. And in 2013, it was the first year ever in the US history where whites had more deaths than births. But that was covered up by immigration, which is no longer, of course, possible. I want to point out that in, as of April 26, 2017, one in eight couples had fertility problems in this country. And I want to show you something really, really important that almost nobody knows about. And that is that all of us are conceived as bisexual organisms, both male and female. We develop as bisexual organisms in our, about our first third of our embryonic life until parts per trillion to parts per quadrillion of our sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen ratio, decides what our sexual appearance will be. And it also controls not only our sexual development, but also the brain development of the sex center. And so <clears throat> I will get into that more later, but I wanted to illustrate for you how all of us started our life as bisexual organisms. Roundup and atrazine, the two number one herbicides used in this country, can alter the balance of testosterone to estrogen. And I will explain why and how that happens in a subsequent slide. Next slide shows our second example neurological development in fetuses. In 1975, one in 5,000 births was autistic. By 2014, one birth in 68 was autistic. And this was going on in Europe, it's going on in the US, it's going on very broadly across the globe. The consequences of this for our intellectual development and our functions, um, you can decide for yourself. This comes from Martin Ludo's film, Toxic Chemicals, Our Kids in Danger. <clears throat> and by the way, the 2015 survey showed that one in 45 US births are autistic. Now, I'm not saying it's only chemicals because there are environmental factors, uh, but also genetic factors. But this trend here cannot be explained by better diagnosis or anything like that. I also want to give you an example number three. This comes from a paper by Bach in the New England Journal of Medicine. He points out how diseases that we can put vaccines to them have been dropping uh, substantially over time. But at the same time that these have been dropping, the ones that we can vaccinate against, the chronic diseases like MS, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, asthma, have been escalating substantially. Chronic diseases are driven by problems with immune function. And we'll talk about that too, because that's a key part of all of this. I also do want to point out that the current administration is defunding the highly successful WHO program for early containment of highly infectious diseases like Ebola. We don't have enough money to handle that. Here is the theory behind all of this, and it ties it all together. And so I'll take a little bit of time to explain it. It's a paper that we published in 1999, and it's a modification of that. But basically, we are looking at the hypothesis that everything is interconnected, and the overview theory, and that is that neurological, endocrine, and immune functions are all interconnected. 
and developmental and genetic effects are part of this, as I'm going to explain as we continue through this slide. But basically, when we had breakfast this morning, we took in mass and energy and nutrients. And that fuels our molecular and cellular systems. These comprise the basics for our organ systems, like the central nervous system, the endocrine system, and the immune system. These all talk to each other with over 20 different, no, 60 different chemicals are used in this communication process. These two are cellular molecular organ system functions support at the individual level reproduction, growth, and behavior. And that supports population level functions like birth rates, death rates, and social structure. And that supports community level functions like immigration, emigration, relative species abundance. I want to watch for inverse dose responses for all three of these. I'm going to show you data on that. That is, the lower the dose, the greater the effect, not the reduction in effect. We'll talk about why that is later, maybe in the question and answer session. The gut is critically important because all the bacteria in the gut account for about 70% of our immune function. And so when we start messing up our gut bacteria, we're messing with our entire immune system. And that's a serious issue. Finally, gene expression. It's controlling what's going on at the molecular and cellular systems. And these dots and dashes are here for a purpose. This is like Morse code. Da -da 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 -da. Anybody know what that means? That's SOS. What's happening on the other side here, where we've got pesticides present that are undermining this support, this support structure here on both sides, is that environmental contaminants it's turning out can hack that code. And so instead of dots and dashes, we've got the, which is no information at all, static. And I'll illustrate for you how we shut down the ability to express our genes by means of pesticides and chemicals. Finally, I want to point out that this whole superstructure rests, of course, on beneficial soil microorganisms. Because all our food comes from these indirectly because they provide nutrients to plants. That's actually what that green grass was all about. The main reason why Chip Osborne was able to grow such great grass was he went after the soil and the microorganisms in the soil. When you get those working right, every organic farmer knows this, then you get production like you wouldn't believe. Roundup stops aromatic amino acid synthesis in bacteria. And that means you've got antibiotic effects. And the consequence of that is that Roundup shuts down these beneficial microorganisms in the soil. So you lose all that support system, all that support function in the soil. And we'll talk about that in more detail later, too. Now I want to get at just a few very basic principles, but it's, it's central to understanding how and why chemicals can have such very broad effects on health of organisms, both plant and animal. And let's just take a plant, for example. This is, might be a cross-section through a leaf. This is the top of the leaf. This is the bottom of the leaf. It's got the stomates, the breathing pores of plants. Um, if you want to develop a pesticide, there are two ways you can get into the organism really quickly and easily. One is through its skin. And the way you do that is you add lipid solvents to the pesticides. And that allows it to dissolve in the wax, get through into the center of the organism, and then go about and kill it. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, too. The other easy way in is through the breathing pores, either the stomates for the plants or the spiracles for insects, or actually our lungs. Every respiratory surface has a lining, a hemisphere of water, which has surface tension to it. And that surface tension tends to protect and keep things out of the plant. But if you weaken it, by adding surfactants, then it becomes much more permeable and you can get rapid entry this way too. And of course, we have a waxy skin and we have lungs with respiratory surfaces uh, that are lined by hemispheres of water. And that means then that <coughs> materials can get, thanks to these solvents and surfactants, these pesticides can go right through the skin and if you don't believe that how waxy your skin is, take a look at it when you shower next time and watch how the water beads up on your skin, just like a newly waxed car. Or you can think about it this way. If you step out into the rain, why don't you dissolve? 
So by entering through the skin or the respiratory surfaces, you bypass some of the natural defenses of the body, like the liver and the kidney. And that means that you can, and because of these solvents, you can cross any kind of uh, tissue barrier. So you get right to the brain, you get right to the fetus. You go right through the umbilical cord, right through the placenta, right into the fetus. So these surface, these solvents and surfactants are critical, and they are not part of the registration process. The registration process by the EPA only involves the active ingredient. But when you put all this together, you've got a very different chemical mix, but they never tell you that. That means that our registration process is functionally a bait and switch process. You register one thing, you sell the consumer something completely different. Now I want to talk about how do you kill an organism with a pesticide. Firstly, we have to look at the structure. Now one part of the molecule typically, not always, is a ring-shaped structure. This one happens nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon. This is the basis for the atrazine herbicide molecule. Now they hang off a different charged group here, or charged groups actually in plural. I've just for illustration put a nitrogen and two hydrogens here, attached it to it, and what that does is it gives it some polarity and that makes it water soluble. The, the, the lack of electrostatic charge here makes it fat soluble. So now we have a molecule that's both fat soluble and water soluble. Now how do you make that happen? <clears throat> or why do you want to make that happen? Well, <clears throat> the fat solubility here, because it has no electrostatic charges, means that it can dissolve right in the cell membrane, which is a lip phospholipid surface. The first of two principles is fats dissolve in fats. Everybody knows that. The second process, next slide, is opposite charges attract. Anybody that uh, takes a bit of chemistry or physics knows that. So that means that once this thing dissolves in the cell membrane and gets inside the cell, now this goes, in effect, is not active, but the charge is. And that's a positive charge, and if that's a positive charge, it'll be attracted to anything that's negative. So the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. It is the thing that keeps us alive. It gives us the energy to breathe and to see and to hear and to talk. <clears throat> you get in here, you shut off the flow of electrons, you shut off the power of the cell. It's like pulling the master switch. The cell dies. Or, alternatively, this thing might slide over here to DNA, which has a net negative charge as well. And this flat dinner plate shaped molecule slides in between the rungs of the DNA ladder and then when the DNA starts to unwind to copy itself, it comes to this point and it breaks. And we call that a mutation. And so <clears throat> these two principles here govern entry and possible modes of action. Also, these charges would act, interact with anything of opposite charge like a chloride ion. That's an important ion in terms of nerve cell conduction. Also, those other ingredients that we talked about, those surfactants, uh, and uh, uh, solvents, these disrupt and break cell membranes so that if this doesn't work, it just tears the cell apart anyway. So we have a molecular bull in a china shop. Its capacity for damage is essentially unlimited and it only takes 12 molecular breaks in chromosome to start cancer in a cell. Not very many. So it doesn't take too many molecules. That's an infinitesimally small molecule material. Now I want to talk a little bit about pea GMO crops and I want to be sure that I'm using the word pea because that refers to pesticides. I'm not saying all GMO crops are bad, but I'm saying the ones of concern are ones that either produce pesticides like corn, GMO corn, or are resistant to pesticides like GMO soybeans. These are the ones where when you've got pesticides involved, we've got lots of additional concerns that aren't typically addressed. Corn produces, or has, has engineered into it, four different varieties, typically, of these Bt toxins. They're designed to kill bugs by paralyzing their gut, starving the uh, insects, and then, then, and then they die. The other thing that typically is done is you put atrazine on the ground for weed control. That is drawn up into the plants, becomes part of the corn. The way this Bt toxin works is the corn cells produce what's called a prototoxin. 
And then the gut enzymes break that down into what's called an endotoxin. And that endotoxin just is a device for punching holes in the cell walls of plant cells or any other kind of cell. And so you create leakage on the cell membrane. The cell runs out of juice and it dies. Very common method of destruction. Our immune system uses the same principle. I want to show you what the stomach of a pig-fed GMO feed looks like. This comes from a paper by Judy Carmon and her colleagues published in 2013, a long-term toxicology study on pigs fed a combined genetically modified GMO soy and GMO corn diet. This was published in the Journal of Organic Systems. This red versus that control stomach here shows you something very important, inflammation. Inflammation means immune activity. And what it also means is that <clears throat> when inflammation happens, capillary cells, the cells that carry our blood, <clears throat> open up. They open up to allow uh, white blood cells to come out and to attack an infection. But it also means that by opening up the walls of the cell, basically, you make it possible for things to escape from the stomach and be absorbed by your circulatory system. Raises the question, may complete genes pass from food to human blood? This was a study done on over a thousand human samples from four independent studies. They report evidence that meal-derived DNA fragments, which are large enough to carry complete genes, can avoid degradation through an unknown mechanism enter the human circulation system. In one of the blood samples, the relative concentration of plant DNA is higher than the human's DNA. Now, plant cells like to pick up DNA. It's kind of goodies for them. And so if you've got foreign stuff going around in your body, the chances of your cells picking that up are not zero. Also of importance is that foreign molecules that get into the bloodstream stimulate the immune system. That means chronic, long-term, low-level inflammation. That's what we saw in that pig gut stomach. <clears throat> this is part of what we are concerned about in terms of human nutrition. I want to point out to you some of the known things that Roundup, that is the mixture, glyphosate, surfactants, and non-ionic solvents can do and its implications. The first one is DNA damage, which alters gene expression, which alters developmental patterns. I'm going to show you some examples of that in just a minute lowers aromatase. This is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. It's a one-way conversion, can't go back. It changes fetal brain and gonad development, which changes sexual preferences. It also stimulates what's called the retinoic acid pathway, which produces too much vitamin A. And vitamin A is known by all pediatricians to cause birth defects. And so when a woman is pregnant, She's advised to make sure that she doesn't have too much vitamin A. It also, energy, it also alters energy metabolism in the mitochondria that we talked about. That means oxidative stress. That's a big one. <clears throat> it kills nerves, alters immune function, alters hormone levels, and is the basis for more than 10 chronic diseases. It shuts down the shikimate pathway. I've referred to this earlier. It's the loss of aromatic amino acids, the loss of beneficial bacteria in the gut, which are being clobbered by this stuff, and that means an impact of about 70% of our immune functions, which uh, are occurring due to gut activity. Roundup is used as a desiccant and a weed killer. It can be applied to cane sugar and beet sugar a day or two before harvest, which means that when they produce the sugar, from sugar cane or sugar beets. If it's not organic, it can be in the sugar. Humans are showing a lot of glyphosate in their urine these days. Roundup chelates divadal, divalent metal ions. Chelates means just simply ties them up. It grabs them and keeps them from being available to the body. Things like calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper. In fact, the original patent for cleaning out boilers that's what Roundup was designed to do, was to clean out boilers. 
<clears throat> significance, calcium and magnesium are critical for catalytic reaction leading to DNA break, uh, cleavage. <clears throat> Dive in, or two charge, double charge ions in general are involved in biological catalytic enzyme reactions. In other words, all those vitamins and minerals we're using are really forms in a way of uh, catalytic ions that are part of the molecule. And you can check this out by simply going to Google and typing in pan glyphosate monograph 2016 or this other reference here. I want to point out to you that the evidence is in hiding in plain sight. Just simply check out Google Scholar. It's there. And 20, very recently, 2018, just this year, in Nature Communications, a very important article came out where they were looking at, and here's the, here was the scientific title, here's the translation, How Good Bacteria Control Your Genes. Chemical signals from gut bacteria influence the gene regulation in the gut lining. That is, they're turning genes on and off in your gut. The bacteria are talking to you and you're talking to it. There's a two-way feedback here. It's very dynamic. And there's a very distinct possibility that they're also doing the same thing in the brain and other organs. Endocrine effects. Here's where things really get very interesting. And it relates to sexual preferences and reproductive success and everything else that we were talking about earlier in terms of that. Cholesterol, we start with cholesterol, which is actually a very useful molecule. Take it through a series of reactions to testosterone. And then testosterone is converted to estrogen because of an enzyme called aromatase. That enzyme, if atrazine is around, will increase the production of aromatase. And what that is like is it's like a having a dam in a river. As you open up the floodgates, you get more and more estrogen and less and less testosterone. That means feminization if you're a male, and especially if you're in utero, that means you're gonna have lower sperm production. We saw that. You're gonna get ovaries and testes. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Mammary tissue and male breasts. Changes in sexual orientation. Roundup, on the other hand, can induce masculinization because it can shut down aromatase, so you build up testosterone you reduce the amount of estrogen, and if you get masculinizing a female in utero, you may be generating what we call polycystic ovary syndrome, a syndrome that's in more than 10% of the women in this country right now. What it means is they can't ovulate easily. They have great pain. They begin to put on weight. They develop facial hair. They have a type 2 diabetes tendency. Uh, besides being obese, and what my wife has shown recently, <clears throat> that what's actually going on is that when you get that exposure, your fundamental biochemistry changes, and the carbohydrates that you're eating now are being routed into fat synthesis, and now the energy production cycle doesn't have any carbos, and it doesn't have any lipids, because the enzymes to convert lipids to sugars are shut down in this synthesis process. So the only thing left is amino acids. So this woman is having her proteins broken down to keep her alive, and she's putting on fat like crazy, and she's starving herself. It's a terrible syndrome, very difficult one to deal with. There is no cure for it. And here are the two references for these effects. There are many others. Those are just two examples of, of, of papers dealing with the effects of Roundup or atrazine on, on aromatase. So we've got Roundup in our PR GMO soybeans. We've got GMO corn being treated with atrazine. So here's the question. What are relevant concentrations of estrogen in humans? And is there evidence for reproductive impairment? Here is a slide from my Zoology 101 textbook. And it's a, basically a time sequence from day one of a menstrual cycle in a woman to day 28 in the menstrual cycle. Now, we've got several things going on. Here's a measure of what's going on in the brain in terms of two hormones, LH and FSH. This is what causes ovulation. Here is the ovarian cycle where the egg is in a growing follicle. And as the follicle gets bigger, it starts producing more and more estrogen. And 
<clears throat> just before it, this thing is ready to rupture, we reach 400 parts per trillion because this is producing more and more of the hormone estrogen. So as that rises, now we reach 400 parts per trillion, all of a sudden the brain, which has been inhibiting the release of LH and FSH because of these low levels, now completely flips and there's this big surge of hormone causing the rupture here. Now the concentration of progesterone drops and you get into the corpus luteum, which is continuing to produce some progesterone and other hormones to maintain the uterine lining for a while. And then if there's no fertilization, then you get menstruation. But we're talking about 40 to 400 parts per trillion. What that means is <clears throat> we can have impacts on the developing fetal brain because it responds to parts per trillion. Completely opposite body response to low versus higher estrogen concentration. A part per trillion is equivalent to taking about 20 Olympic swimming pools and putting one drop of estrogen in those pools altogether. That's the level we're talking about. Incredibly tiny amounts. This is from Dr. Tyrone Hayes at Berkeley. He's been working also with atrazine for a long time and its effects on feminizing male frogs at environmentally relevant concentrations. Here is the amount of percent of the animals that are fertile if they haven't been exposed. This is what happens when you give them atrazine at environmentally relevant concentrations. Again, what I showed you very early on, this general principle that terrestrial vertebrates are conceived as bisexual organisms. We develop dual prim primitive reproductive tracts, normally dispose of one of them during development based on that ratio at decision time, about a third of the way through development. If pseudoestrogens, that is false uh, estrogens like plasticizers and things are present, it looks to a male embryo that it is more female, so it changes direction, induces fewer Sertoli cells, which are the sperm nurse cells in the testis and alters the brain's sex center development accordingly. And now I wanna show you in the next slide the consequences of that for two male frogs attempting to copulate with each other. Both of these animals have both male and female reproductive tracts. Tim Pasteur, the spokesman for Syngenta that makes atrazine says, the EPA believes that no additional testing is warranted to address this issue. I should point out to you that Syngenta, the makers of atrazine, which upregulates aromatase, which elevates estrogen, which elevates breast cancer risk, also makes drugs that treat breast cancer. Win-win situation. Well, now the question obviously is, might estrogen changes alter human sexual behavior? I want to point out to you that the estrogen receptor is very promiscuous. It has at least 12 partners, phthalates, flame retardants, which are in your sofas and your bed mattresses, plasticizers like nonolphenol, PCBs, and then also dioxins, the most potent estrogen mimic in the planet, it has a very long lifetime, about maybe 20 years. Phthalates, more plasticizers in baby bottles and things, everybody's heard about those. But this paper by Bruce, Bruce McEwen was published in 1987. He's one of the top reproductive endocrinologists in the world, an epidemiologist, and he asked this question, are these steroid hormones and brain development being modified by some pseudo-hormones and other toxic agents? There's a paragraph in that paper, and here it is right here, called Psychosexual Differentiation and Diethylstilbestrol, DES. Further insight into actions of estrogen on brain development has come from studies of offspring of mothers exposed to the pseudoestrogen diethylstilbestrol during pregnancy. It was given in the 60s and 70s because they thought it would prevent miscarriage, and so doctors began to pres prescribe it prophylactically. In studies thus far completed and published, prenatal DES alters general matters measures of personality and leads to altered patterns of sexual behavior in adolescence and adulthood that reduce formation of heterosexual relationships. These differences from carefully matched normal subjects could not be explained by sexual dysfunctions, such as vaginismus and dyspareunia, which were low in both groups. 
but rather appear to be due to psychosocial and neuroendocrine factors related to DES exposure. This was a synthetic progesterone. And here were the three references that those, that statement came from. Well, we began to wonder <clears throat> if what, maybe some of these chemicals might be able to induce abortions and resorptions of fetuses. Uh, this was work done with Fernanda Cavier, who's one of my graduate students. And we went to Farm and Fleet and we decided to pick our herbicide. Um, in this case, it contained <coughs> 2,4-D, uh, chlorophenoxyacetic derivatives, uh, mycoprop, and benzoic acid derivative, dicamba. This has been very famous lately because of its drift all over uh, the Midwest and the impact it's had on farming. What do you notice about all three of these different chemicals? A ring-shaped structure, fat solubility, electrostatic charges, strong ones, negative chloride groups, a negative acid group, present in all of them. This new genetically modified 2,4-D resistant alfalfa, you always get two forms of dioxin when you make 2,4-D, always. This is that imitator of female sex hormone estrogen. So it gets into the alfalfa, the cows eat it, or the grass that's being, the alfalfa that's being fed to any domestic animal eats it, and it gets into their fat, and then you cook that, and you eat that. Here were the results of that experiment. We used a very low dose, a low dose, an interim dose, and a high dose. There's the control animals weren't fed any. <clears throat> Here's 39 parts per billion, 30, 322 parts per billion, 320 parts per billion, this number and that number. So those were the doses that we gave. And here was the average litter size. Here were the controls. We had a little over average of 10 was the average litter size. The smallest litter size was eight. Somebody tell me which one of those treatments, those concentrations, gave us the greatest fetal losses? The very low dose, that's right. Inverse dose response. We're getting into the region where the body's responding endocrinologically, just like we saw before. These are all, all the darker colors are losses. And you can see there are losses in every category other than the controls. So we've got our endocrine dose, inverse dose response. This one is immune inverse dose response. This is the one that got us excommunicated from the EPA. We were looking at aldicarb, a pesticide used in the central sands of Wisconsin on potatoes and other crops. It's used on watermelon and citrus. You apply it. <clears throat> we were looking at how many, how, much, how many antibodies can you make to a foreign protein. And here are the controls, lots of antibody to a foreign protein. EPA said 1,000 parts per billion was totally safe. We, you know, we said, let's take a look at 100, let's take a look at 10, and let's take a look at 1. This was very highly significant, and you can see, an, again, an inverse dose response. We repeated that experiment four different times, and there's a long story to go with that, to prove to ourselves that this was real. This was way back in the 70s. I want to point out to you that immune insult is associated with many serious chronic health problems. This is a paper by Dietert and Dieter in 2007. These diseases include asthma and allergic diseases, autoimmunity, infectious diseases and ineffective vaccine responses, cancer, neurodegenerative disease and neurocognitive loss, cerebral palsy, atherosclerosis, hypertension, male sterility. I want to point this one out. Ineffective vaccine responses. Why is that significant? Because approximately 30% of the US population are on various kinds of drugs like antidepressants that have immunosuppressive properties. That suggests that there could be as many as one third of us in this room if you are taking medications that might be having your immune system suppressed. That means that you would not respond to vaccines. You might not be able to. 
And that would mean that if we get smart bugs or bioterrorism, we're looking at a third of our population that may be in jeopardy. That's not trivial. How about neurological effects, learning and behavioral disorders? This was the first human experiment, in effect, published by Elizabeth Gillette, an epidemiologist, an anthropology type specialist down in Florida, and a whole series of Mexican colleagues. And the title is An Anthropological Approach to the Evaluation of Preschool Children Exposed to Pesticides in Mexico. This was done because there was an experiment in effect that happened in Mexico where uh, <clears throat> the Yaqui Valley in Sonora, Mexico became, <clears throat> it was sold off, purchased by a U.S. corporation that received some foundation money to help develop the economy of Mexico. And so they bought this valley which was inhabited by Native Americans of Inca descent and they said, we're going to raise fruits, winter fruits and vegetables for the U.S. here. We'd like you to work the fields for you. We'll pay you lots of money. Oh, and by the way, we're going to spray about every week or two, but that shouldn't be a problem. Well, half that population said, no, thank you, and they moved lock, stock, and barrel up the mountain. So all of a sudden, we now had a homogeneous, relatively homogeneous population that was split in half. One half exposed to pesticides, the other going and continuing their environmental uh, organic type agriculture. Within a very short time, the women down in the valley were developing breast cancer in significant numbers. But it was the children that caused them to bring in Dr. Gillette. And <clears throat> she began to evaluate them because the kids in the valley were a bit different. They couldn't jump rope, they had no energy. They couldn't drop a, a jelly bean into a bottle and hit the bottle. The kids up on the mountain could do both. The kids up on the mountain could walk a straight line on a rail, but the kids down in the valley were falling off after about one or two steps. They were losing their balance. They were losing their equilibrium. They were losing their coordination. And the next slide is the key one because that shows the comparison between the kids up on the mountains and the kids down in the valley. These are the same age group. They were asked to draw a human figure. When my sister saw these slides, she, tears came to her eyes. She said, I've never seen such neurological devastation. These children are likely never to form normal social relationships. Here we have what you expect on a three or four or five year old, facial features, digits on the hands and feet. And what you can't see is how they drew these. The kids from the mountains drew from the top and worked down. The kids from the valley started at the bottom and worked up. And Dr. Gillette told me that when she asked this, uh, the child that drew this, she said, where's the top? And the child pointed there. Where's the bottom? They pointed there. The current status. The valley teen boys may have memory tissue in their tender breasts. The valley teen girls only have fat in their breasts. So if they ever had children, it might be the boys that might be able to nurse, not the girls, if given the proper hormone. Children's mothers in the valley had very high rates of breast cancer. They continue to have them, but the question that we have to ask, what will be our children's future? And here's a hint. How much are we spending on remedial education? In Madison, Wisconsin, in 1997, we were already spending more on remedial education than we were on reading and writing and arithmetic. And it's gotten a lot worse. I want to show you the gut and the impact of pesticide like, in this case, glyphosate, where they measured it in the urine of these three triplets. And Clostridia botulinum, botulism toxins, are immune to glyphosate. And so if you get it in your food, your good gut bacteria die, and your botulinum toxins begin to be produced. And secreted into the body. And here it is, glyphosate plus other toxic chemicals in Roundup kill the beneficial bacteria that degrade glyphosate, the increased harmful clostridia and increased urine in, life, in glyphosate. That, I just wanted to emphasize that. Bad bacteria have no problem with it. 
increased inhibition of a neurotransmitter dopamine or uh, an enzyme involved in dopamine synthesis, we get, get increased neurotransmitter dopamine in the, in the cell contents. And then those toxic metabolites there act to increase damage to brain mitochondria, increase denaturization of the long uh, axons of the neurons. They're proteins that screws them up and the enzyme uh, factory that provides all of our energy is affected, decreasing available energy. So they've, they've actually worked out the pathway by which Roundup can impact brain function. And once you begin to kill the outer protective microglia on the neurons, then the microglia themselves start producing toxins that kill the nerves. So it's a multi-step process, but we're beginning to understand the mechanisms behind at least the neurological effects here. But once you start changing the brain, the brain isn't responsible for a lot of your hormones. And so all of a sudden now you're looking at your hormones. And the hormones are talking to the immune system, and the immune system is feeding back. So you've got this massive interconnected effect due to changing the gut microbes. And this is purely correlation, but it's just the use of atrazine relative to the number of children with autisms uh, with time. Well, Dr. Paul Winchester, who's director of neonatology at St. Francis Hospital in Indianapolis said, I wonder whether or not atrazine also could affect neurological development, that other herbicide. And here he, he did something very interesting. He plotted the month that the child was conceived against the uh, concentration of atrazine. This is atrazine here, it goes way up in the summertime. And then when they reach high school and they measure their math and their language <laughs> skills, here's what happens to those language skills. Just a correlation, but a very interesting one. Rodriguez et al. also looked at atrazine and they discovered that atrazine alters the brain neurotransmitters. An inverse dose response was seen in the decision part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which says, should I do this or should I not do this? And so if we're impacting on the capacity to decide, well, should we or should we not? Then all of a sudden, next slide, we begin to wonder, are any of these school shootings that we're seeing are partly being driven by exposures? He also said, hey, I wonder about the month of conception relative to birth defects. Could we be having birth defects in humans? Is there any correlation? And this one here is a plot of the, of, uh, the frequency of hypospadias in males. I don't know if any of you know what a hypospadia is but it's, it's the opening of the penis, and if it's not out at the tip, it might be part way down, or it might even be at the base of the penis. So you typically have to have an operation to restructure that. <clears throat> and what we see is when the water supply and the atrazine that they're consuming in that water increases, and they happen to be conceived in those months, um, you have a statistically significant difference. Another kind of birth defect. This is called gastroschisis. It's a new epidemic from rural areas in Wisconsin and around the country. And uh, I want to ask you a question. What does this picture suggest to you? Genetic control of development has been changed. That's not a normal fetus. They have to be born with cesarean section techniques and then operated on. Also, change in fetal gene expression. In 2005, there was a key paper published in Science Magazine, one of our top journals in the, in the world. And the title was Epigenetic Transgenerational Actions of Endocrine Disruptors and Male Fertility. And then a year later, another paper, Transgenerational, Four Generations, Epigenetic Imprinting of the Male Germline by Endocrine Disrupting Exposure During Gonadal Sex Determination. Four generations, it becomes heritable. Your great-great-grandchildren are being impacted by what happened to you. Here is what happened to the brain of the rats that were done in this experiment. This is the percent of gene expression in the control animals versus vinclozal. And this is a fungicide used on grapes to make wine. Less than 20% of, of the genes in the brain were being expressed 
when they were exposed to that pesticide, that fungicide. Turns them off. Why would we be interested in that particular group of genes? Because this controls Alzheimer's, synovial cancers, schizophrenia, mutant allele specific amplification syndrome, neural tube defects, various tumors. Multi-generational heritable changes are not easily dismissed. We might be looking at a 100-year hit on our genome. We don't know. So we've shown you how we can decrease birth rates. Let's talk about increased death rates. Compromise, neurological, endocrine, immune, epigenetic. This is the gene on-off switching that happens. If we're compromising epigenetic function, that means we're changing our fundamental metabolism, our metabolic pathways, like that PCOS syndrome in women that I was talking about. There's a couple of new technologies developed by MetResponse, a company developed by my wife. Metabolic dynamics platform that allows you to look at the effects biochemically of stress, infection, disease, toxicants, hibernation, substrate utilization, and gut microbiome functions. And a stable isotope-assisted labeling technology where we can actually watch in real time, non-invasively from your breath your response to perturbations like stress, infection, disease, toxicants, hibernation, and so on. So there are now ways that we're beginning to be able to track in a biochemical sense and to fingerprint what's going on. This is a very exciting new set of technologies that uh, uh, are going to revolutionize our ability to diagnose and establish cause and relation. And here's how it happens. We just take some urine, or some serum, put them in very tiny tubes. These are only about this tall and about very narrow diameter. You take up them up the stairs and put them in this NMR machine, and you get this kind of a result. These are the different kinds of biomarkers in the serum, um, and we're looking in the gray at what happens to different biomarkers relative to controls. So this is an increase. This is a more than doubling up here, and this is a decrease here. Atrazine has a whole lot of effects. It's all of these gray things. Nitrate, uh, and these are both environmentally relevant concentrations, alter these markers. And when we put the two together, they tend to actually cancel each other a bit. And we get this particular characteristic signature. This is just one illustration. I can tell you that while I can't, well, since it hasn't been published, I can't tell you what those molecules are exactly. We're looking at key lipid or fat, amino acid, and energy cycle pathways that are being altered by the exposure to an herbicide and or nitrate of fertilizer. So, summary, how do you control population size, the ecology of toxicology? We're going to decrease births, lower fertility, reduce mating success, increase birth defects, change fetal gene expression. Increase deaths, enhance aggression, contaminate our air, food, and water, compromise neurological, hormone, immune, epigenetic functions, none of which are tests in EPA registration. None. And alter the metabolome, that is the biochemical pathways. In summary, what have we learned? Data suggests that we may be sexually assaulting our children in utero, possibly altering their sexual preferences or aborting them prematurely. Virtually no marketed pesticide formulation has ever been registered by the EPA. There are no data on formulations. There are no data from collective sensitive tests. Registrations do not include tests for neurological, endocrine, immune, developmental, or epigenetic, which is DNA methylation tests. Those are the on-off gene switches. And data for registrations come from the companies that make the chemicals a clear conflict of interest, which means we're using biased data to make our decisions about safety. So we have to ask, can we afford to raise generations of children that are neurologically, endocrinologically, immunologically, and reproductively impaired? Can we afford to induce chronic, long-term, subtle diseases and alter gene expression that may be passed to subsequent generations? These are questions we have to address. Here's a solution. We need good decisions based on unbiased research. We need PGMO labeling. Change in market share, that's what's going to do it. How you spend your dollars. And it's already changing. You look at what's happening in the organic market. 
look what's happening to organic baby foods. People are getting the message and it's happening faster and faster. So what is working now is that with consistent unbiased data, we can work to get these de in decline. The change in market share means increased demand for organic soils and food, clean water and clean air, which is going to stabilize the population and lead to sustainability. I'm often asked, Warren, don't you think things are going a little too slowly? We need to change things faster. And I say, well, that reminds me of this story about Howard Harrison. He was a very famous jet pilot in the Vietnam War, ace, absolute ace. And when he retired from the Air Force, <clears throat> he uh, went to work for a uh, major airline carrier. And he was flying these 747s, perfect safety patterns, perfect landing patterns. And one year he said, I'm getting tired of right going through your doggone physicals every year. I'm not going to do it this year. And he said, Howard, you take the exam, and we're going to ground you. I said, all right, all right, I'll take your exam again. And so he went through the exam, sailed through it until he got to the very last exam, which was the I exam. And he could hardly read the E on the top of the chart. And the doctor was examining him and said, Howard, how do you do that? You've got perfect landing patterns, perfect safety record, and you're so nearsighted you can hardly read the E on the top of my chart. Howard said, Doc, I've been flying since I was 14. I know what I'm doing. I get in the cockpit. I get taxi clearance. We taxi down to the end of the runway. I get takeoff clearance, I shove the stick forward, and off we go. And then I get up in the air, and I just dial the autopilot, plane flies itself. Get near the airport, and get on the white pin, and shove the stick forward, and down, down, down we go. Oh. And Doc said, I know, I know, Howard, but why don't you crash? Doc, it's easy. Just keep going down and down and down. And when the co-pilot says, Jesus Christ, when I pull back. <laughs> Thank you very much.